Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition, a program where we take a look at Scripture, the, the teaching of the Bible, but we also incorporate that apostolic tradition uh, that was passed on from Jesus to the apostles and from the apostles to their disciples and down to us as the way to understand Scripture, the context for understanding Scripture. And today on our show, we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount and how it sets out a number of basic moral and spiritual teachings and principles related to our salvation and the good works that we do within salvation. Now we're continuing to use my book, Saved, a Bible study for Catholics. It's a roadmap, plus I've added on a few things. So if you are following along with us, in my book, we're beginning on page 120. You can get that book at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com. And the book is number is item number T1784. T1784. Now, if you have any questions or comments for the show, let us know. We'd love to get them. Uh, you can email us or you can go online to our Facebook or YouTube pages. Or during the live program, which is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, you can call in a question live. The phone number is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are not in North America, though, that won't work. So you can call another number if you are outside North America. It's country code one Area code 205-271-2980. And if you are from outside North America, we will push you right up to the uh, top of the list and get to your question first. Right, as I <coughs> mentioned at the beginning, we're going to take a look at the Sermon on the Mount. This is the section of the Gospels, of all four Gospels, that mentions the Greek word dikaiosune more often than any other section. Now the word dikaiosune is the word that is translated in a couple of different ways. Sometimes it is translated as righteousness and righteousness is using a good Anglo-Saxon roots. It comes from our German roots. Uh, English is basically a German language. And so in Rechtfertigung in German is righteousness in English, and it's the same root. But it can also be translated with a Latin root word, namely justification. And you hear a lot about justification. And the word can be translated by either term, the Latin root justification or the Anglo-Saxon root righteousness. Now, they have different nuances, to be sure, but we'll see some of the impact of this. Now, in, we'll start with the Sermon on the Mount, uh, with Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. This is where our Lord saw the crowds and he went up the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him and began to speak and taught them. Now, why is he on this mountain? The hill that we call the Mount of Beatitudes is well known. And there's a wonderful church run by Franciscan nuns. And as is always the case, they're an example to me of why I think nuns ought to be in charge of the government. Everything is clean. <laughs> and it's also kept in budget. And if the 
altar boys or anybody else misbehaves, those nuns grab them by the earlobe and take them into the sacristy and wear them out. So <laughs> we use a lot more of that in government these days. But I digress. Also, our Lord, on the side of that mountain, the south face of that mountain, it is a natural amphitheater. You have the top, and it slopes down to a plain. There's, there's this plateau and where the people could gather. And if you stand at the top of the mountain and speak on that south face, it has perfect acoustics naturally, like an amphitheater. So it's a perfect place to teach. And as the, the crowds are there, um, they could listen. But also, it shows how Christ is a new Moses raising up a new Israel. Moses had gone to the top of Mount Sinai. Now Christ goes up to this mount. Moses gave commandments. Our Lord gives the Beatitudes, and that's the parallel. And the Beatitudes are proclamations. That the Beatitude is a common form of speech in the Bible. And it's in both Testaments, and especially comes to refer to ultimate happiness, namely getting to heaven. So our Lord announces these Beatitudes at the very beginning. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for re your reward is great in heaven. In the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, think about these Beatitudes. All of them are, are actions that demonstrate that you have faith. If you are poor in spirit, think about what that means. This is the ability to be detached from things of this world. You don't... I, and if you have good sense and think about it, you don't really own stuff long term. When you die, you, even if they put it in your coffin, you're not really taking it with you. <laughs> you're not. That's why it's dumb to put golf clubs in the coffins. <laughs> you're under the green. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> Leave it to your relatives so they can use it on top of the green. And the reason I mentioned golf clubs is I was talking to a funeral director after a family funeral. Uh, he'd been funeral director for our family for, well, his family had been funeral directors for my family for a couple, a few generations. And he said, Next to rosary, rosary is the most common thing put in a coffin, but then next is golf clubs. Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, I've got some cool rosaries. I hope you don't put the good ones in there. Let somebody else use them. They're, they're nice. Um, but they're, they're, you, know, you just don't take stuff with you. You use things during this life. You get a deed to your house so nobody takes it under the law. But it, when you die, it's gone. And having that poverty of spirit realizes, I'm going to use this. Now, am I going to use these things for selfish person, purposes, or am I going to use them for the greater glory of God? 
That's where we have an, e an attitude of being equal-minded. I can use stuff or not use them insofar as it gives glory to God. And, and the this, this same thing with being meek. You know, in the culture, they want us to consider that you win through intimidation. That was the title of a book. And you go, uh, and people try to use that kind of approach. And ultimately, you know, you, you see that those who try that tend to have sh even short-lived. Look at the Third Reich. That was supposed to be a thousand-year Reich. It lasted from 1932 to 1945. 13 years, not a thousand years. And the communists expected the workers' paradise to go on forever. And communism fell from 1917 to about 70 years later, depending on which country. You know, their intimidation and such, that, and they, it was self-destructive in both cases. Germany suffered tremendously after the war. And Soviet Union devastated its own environment. Well, as we grew wealthy in our system, our environment improved. You know, I remember how the air in my own hometown of Chicago changed for the better. And the, the river was cleaned up and all sorts of things. You know, that we, we improved the environment as time went on. And this, there's a, a meekness that our Lord says will help you inherit the earth. And, you know, even mourning the loss of others comes from a faith in life after death. And there's this sense of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Now, righteousness or justification is something we should hunger for. You don't take it for granted. You make it a thirst that there would be righteousness for everybody, and not just for yourself, but for everyone. These are the kinds of values, and our Lord wants us to be pure in heart so we can see God. Those who do not have a purity of heart will only see the filth that covers their eyes. There has to be a cleansing from the filth. And that, that sin brings upon us. And even if we are persecuted for the sake of what's righteous or for the sake of Christ, in either case, that Christ promises that we will receive our reward. All of these beatitudes see that there's going to be this reversal. And this is very, very important to keep in mind. Then we go to the very next section of the Sermon on the Mount, verses 13 to 16. And there you see that Christ wants to give us our identity. We have plenty of songs that have been sung over the years, not just recently, but in times past. I Gotta Be Me uh, and things like that. You know, they're very popular, but Christ is saying that he will give us our identity. A number of times he does this. In this passage, in Matthew 5, 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. And you are the light of the world. The city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Not to you, but to your Father. Now think about this. Now, a lot of people have asked me over the years, how does salt lose its saltiness? That seems odd, right? The salt in the Dead Sea, 
one of the main sources of salt for this region, is also bonded with a number of other chemicals, many of which are very good for you, uh, for your skin. So, in fact, uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians and Jordanians who live around the Dead Sea all have companies that make beauty products out of Dead Sea salts. And the, the problem in terms of the salt part, though, the salt can become uh, washed away from the other chemicals with which it's bonded. And the other chemicals there, and the saltiness is gone. That's what they're kind of referring to. And so um, this, of course, applies to Christians who seek to accommodate to whatever the world is doing. And the world wants us to do that. The culture wants us to go along with their agenda. Now, which people in the culture do you follow their agenda? You know, which ones? Again, they all compete, and they all want us to get rid of some parts of our Christian doctrine, and especially our Christian morals, in order to have us go along with them. In times past, the idea that we see in the Bible that you have, uh, it, when you were baptized, you have put on Christ. Therefore, there is no longer Jew or Greek, uh, Scythian or, or, uh, uh, or, or civilized people, uh, free or slave, male or female, that the Bible teaches those things don't matter. And a lot of folks have wanted us to get rid of that in favor of racist ideas and that the exclusion of people because of their racial background that's wrong but then we have today they there are folks uh, who want us to now get rid of our christian sexual morality in regard to marriage fidelity and our life values in regard to abortion and euthanasia some of you may have seen one of the uh, politicians is threatening that if he becomes president, that he will make sure that any church that does not do same-sex marriage will lose their tax-exempt status. It wants to change our morality. We have to be salt in the world. And if you remember, when the Supreme Court had made that decision permitting same-sex marriage, I had said this is what it's about. I'd said that years ago. It's not about these folks. It's about being able to take away tax exempt status for churches that don't agree with it. And we have to be that salt who stands up for marriage and stands up for the commitment of husbands and wives to each other and to the children they bring into the world. And this in the face of a culture that wants us to lose that saltiness as more than half of the children are born to unmarried people. We have to keep that saltiness and be light when other people in the society want us to put the light out. That's the identity Jesus Christ gives us, and we will be judged. Notice how he says, if the salt loses its saltiness, what happens? It's tossed out and trampled on. It doesn't do anything to preserve society. Salt preserves food from rotting. And if we don't stay with the saltiness of our Christian faith and morals, we won't be able to preserve society from its own interior tendencies to collapse. Well, we'll stop there for now. We'll come back in just a couple minutes and continue on with our Lord's teaching about righteousness in the Sermon on the Mount. So please stay with us.
All right. So um, we were taking a look at Matthew uh, 5, verses 13 to 16, about being Christ identifying us as the salt of the world and the light of the world. And he gives us that identity, and he wants us to do these good works so people see them. There's this action that people can notice, and he's very concerned about that. But then we also see that in addition to being salt that preserves this world, because again, that's what salt was used for doing. It's not only flavoring food, it preserved it uh, and made some foods edible. I don't know if you know this. Olives are inedible when you pick them raw. I had heard that for many years, but you know, I don't live where they grow olives. So when I was at, in Israel at harvest time once, and I picked an olive, and I want to see how bad it is. That's just kind of the dumb things boys do. And so, so I picked the olive, and I bit into it. I just put my teeth into it. The bitter taste was so nasty, it lasted for another 45 minutes. I didn't even take a bite of it and try to chew it. It was so nasty. But when you soak it in salt, it becomes not only edible, but delicious. And I am impressed with the Neolithic people who first figured that out down in Jericho, it's the earliest uh, olive harvest we know of, and that I know of anyway. And uh, they figured that out. So th that's good to be that salt and be that, have that effect in the world. But then we see now in verses 17 through 19 that our Lord also insists that we be concerned for the next life. So let's take a look at that in verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish, to, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teach others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is very important because our Lord very much wants us to obey his, the, the commandments. And he focuses on that any number of times in the gospel. We'll go th through a number of these passages coming through. But one of the things that we also have to keep in mind is that uh, this, uh, his teaching is that obeying these commandments is going to uh, be very determinative for what our life in heaven is to be. And um, we, we are not to disregard them. Also later on we'll see that he does give authority to Saint Peter specifically in Matthew 16 and then to all the apostles in Matthew 18 to bind and to loose some of these laws but even they, they the Bible is not their plaything. It's not something they do for themselves. They are also subject to the Word of God. And the loosening and tightening of the law has to be on the basis of clear principle. Now, in some ways, that goes back as a clear principle to Jesus' initial proclamation. When he began to preach, what did he say? Look at Matthew 4, verse 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So repent always means to realize, first of all, that you are on the wrong path. You're going the wrong way. 
and you're headed for destruction. And when you realize that, you say, oh, boy, this is the wrong path. And then keep going? No. You stop, you turn around, and go the other direction. This is the way of repentance. The word metanoia means to turn around. And the images of being on the wrong road, you realize that you get back to the road that God sets for us, and you do it. That's repentance. So if you're going to repent, this is what you have to accept. And in another place where we see how good the law is and obeying these laws is necessary, Take a look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, where someone came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And our Lord answers in verse 17, If you would enter life, keep the commandments. This is consistent with what he said here in chapter 5, isn't it? You can't let loose of the commandments. You can't say, well, um, thou shalt not commit adultery is in general a good idea, but it doesn't really apply to me. I don't remember seeing your name on a list of the exemption clause. <laughs> I didn't see that there. Uh, did you put yourself there? Because I don't think God did. You know, same thing with stealing. Same thing with accepting bribes or giving bribes or cheating your employees or cheating your employer, not giving a full day's work for your wages and not giving a decent wage for the work that's done. You know, all of these things are part of the commandments. You don't think of the wages, but if you are not giving a full day's work, if you're sloughing off, or if you are not paying a decent wage, you're stealing from each other. And if you are not patriotic, and it's very important to distinguish patriotism from nationalism. Nationalism puts your country above of God and above the church. That's nationalism. And that's what you had in National Socialism of the uh, National Socialist Workies, Workers' Party. What is that known as? The Nazis. They put the state ahead of God. The communists did that. Lots of other governments do that. No, God is first. And that, but patriotism is a love of your country, where you came from, and care for the rest of the people of your country and service to your country in a variety of ways. So that's, you know, you have to keep the commandments, and that fits the fourth commandment. And the man said to Jesus, well, which? Which commandments? Again, it's not multiple choice. This is where Jesus said, you shall not murder. Okay, you can't do abortions. You can't cut innocent babies into pieces. And you can't kill old people just because they're old. Can't do that. And some of us are getting more nervous about the ones who are trying to push that. <laughs> you can't, thou shalt not commit adultery. You make a commitment to your spouse and you live it. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Well, there is something that they need to hear again in Washington. Honor your father and your mother as well as your neighbor, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. These are the commandments that our Lord says you must do if you would enter life. In fact, in Mark uh, chapter 10, it says if you would be saved. You know, so these are not options. And then the man uh, says, uh, well, I, I have all these I have observed, what do I still lack? And so then Jesus says to him, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And this is something that is a very important way of life. We, we've had uh, religious who have done this from the earliest centuries of the church. 
uh, you know, uh, I, I remember hearing somebody say, well, this is impossible. Jesus was giving a commandment that couldn't work. But the Benedictine order started back in the 400s A.D., and they're still going strong. You know, almost 1,600 years later. It can work by God's grace, by God's grace. So this is something that is, um, th these commandments are very important. And we, Jesus, in various ways, from the, um, the Beatitudes all the way through this question of the rich young man, always lets us know that this is connected to whether or not we're in heaven. These are not optional. These are necessary. And we have to consider this in our spiritual life. Now, we're going to go uh, you know, to other issues in the Sermon on the Mount uh, next week. But let's now take a look at some of the questions. I have a number of questions. I'm going to start off with our studio audience first. Start off with this lady. Ma'am, where are you from? From Indiana. Great. Welcome here. Good to have you. you. And your uh, question? Well, uh, the Pharisees believed in the bodily resurrection. Mm -hmm. What is the Old Testament scripture that, that they used to believe sure. in that? Sure. There are a number of passages. Um, the initial one was Ezekiel's vision of the valley filled with dry bones. And the Lord says, Son of man, prophesy to these bones. And they came together, then prophesy spirit to them. And then they came alive. And then, you all, I think that's Ezekiel 37. And then you see in Isaiah 26 that there is also a proclamation of how the dead will rise from the dust. And then in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, you see that Daniel says that the wicked will rise from the dead as an everlasting nightmare. They'll become, the wicked will become an eternal nightmare, while the righteous will shine like the sun. So this is going to be the option that uh, they have. And um, uh, it, those would be three of the passages. Apart from that, there's not much speculation on life after death in the Old Testament. Uh, Israel didn't like to speculate too much and think about it too much. In general, they thought, well, that's kind of an Egyptian thing. They're always focused on life after death. And they were. The Egyptians built all of their houses out of mud bricks. But their tombs were made out of stone. Why? It's going to last longer. You're going to be dead longer than you're alive. And so they made their houses out of mud bricks that, in fact, melted away practically every year with the Nile floods. But their tombs were up higher, and they built them either cutting into the stone or, in the case of the pyramids, put stone around them. Uh, the Israelites said, mm, that we don't, God hasn't told us much about that. So they didn't say much until Ezekiel's vision, then Isaiah's prophecy in 26, and um, Daniel's vision in chapter 12. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Where are you from? Uh, currently from South Carolina. Great. You like it down there? Yep. It's oh, a nice good. place. Yeah. Yep. Um, Father, you talked about righteousness and justifications. Um, do you think there is such a thing as justifiable anger? Sure. Sure. Do you have kids? Yes, indeed, four of them. I think all the people <laughs> laughing here also have kids because they know where I'm going. And I ten mean, grandchildren, too. And Well, they're easier because uh, you can give them back when they're leaking. <laughs> but, you know, 
especially with your own children. As a matter of fact, grandkids are great because that's an opportunity to get back at your kids by spoiling them, get, giving them sugar, riling them up, and then giving them back. But the, <laughs> but the you know, with, with your children, there were times you could tell they did things just because they're ignorant. They just did something, that's just a dumb thing to do because they just did not know any better. There's other times where they knew exactly what they were doing and they did what they did in order to get your goat. Am I wrong? Yep. And there were, with the one you say, oh, don't do that because, you know, this is the way it's done. Whereas when they were doing it on purpose to be obnoxious, you might could have worn them out <laughs> for doing that. I mean, you disciplined them fairly strictly if you knew they were doing something obnoxious for you. Were you right to be angry? Absolutely. Because that communicates to them that this is not acceptable behavior and you will not do this again, ever, if you value your life and my being outside of prison. You know, <laughs> you know but you, I, the, the time, and there are other times, you know, that's on an everyday level. We also can look at our own experience in uh, various aspects of, say, say po the political. Should the world have been angry at what Hitler was doing to the Jews? Absolutely. There's a righteous anger because it was completely unjustifiable. What we've seen ISIS do to innocent people, killing children, raping people, and selling them in slavery, should we be outraged at that? Absolutely. And, but here's one of the things too, and you know this from raising kids. There's a big difference when you get angry because this gets me upset and I got to get my anger out. I propose that if you're doing this only to get your feelings of anger out, it's easy to become abusive to children. But when you use your anger to make them become better people, then it's directed for their good. If you use self-righteous anger, um, well, I don't like the way this politician speaks. I don't like the way this television person speaks, or whatever it might be. And it's just your anger that's not healthy. But if you're doing it for the sake of what's good in itself, then it's very healthy. That make a helpful distinction? All right. I'm going to take a quick break. We'll be back with some more of your phone calls and questions from the rest of our studio audience. So please stay with us. Right, we have a caller on there. Uh, Stacy, where are you calling from? I'm calling from New York City, Father. New York City, great. And Manhattan. what's your question? Okay, I learned this from you and other people. I learned so much from you. And the question is, uh, my Protestant friend seems to uh, deny the fact that uh, faith alone was put in, the word alone was put in by uh, Luther. Mm -hmm. And he said that James was a straw man. And I didn't quite understand what he meant by calling James a straw man. <laughs> Could 
you uh, explain that to me? Sure, sure. Um, uh, he says that uh, he's sort of slightly misquoting Martin Luther. Luther said that the epistle of James was an epistle of straw written by some Jew. Well, first of all, except for Luke, everything in the Bible was written by Jewish people. I mean, <laughs> who else you got? I mean, so that's, that's crazy. Um, and uh, he, he added that comment to a certain amount of anti-Semitism. That wasn't right. But um, here's the question. On what basis can your friend, Stacy, say that somebody who is an author of sacred scripture, this is not the book of second opinions. This is a book of the sacred scripture. Now, I'll bet your friend believes that you use the Bible alone. I'll bet except when the Bible disagrees with him. That's not smart, I don't think. You, know, you don't choose from the Bible stuff that you don't like and say, well, that's just straw. On what basis do you say that? Does not St. Paul write in the second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God. Now, what you have to do to your friend here is say, what part of all scripture are you rejecting? And on what basis? Now, you may not like James, and he may challenge your ideas, but my question is this. If all scripture is inspired, then it is necessary to accept what James says. And again, in James 2.26, it says, uh, 2.24, sorry, um, that you are not justified by faith alone. If that is the word of God, you have to deal with that. Secondly, I don't care if your friend thinks or feels that uh, Luther did not add the word faith alone or only faith. I don't care what he thinks. Show me the manuscript where the Greek word for faith alone or only faith is found in Romans chapter 4. The manuscript does not exist. I can't go by what he thinks or feels. I have to read the text. And there was a Dr. Link who wrote to Luther in 1529 saying it's not there. And Luther said well, it's there because uh, it is so because Martin Luther says it's so. That's not acceptable. You cannot change texts. You may not like the text, you answer to God for that, but you can't change it. And your friend had better learn enough Greek and check out the Greek for himself to see that the word, neither the words faith alone nor only by faith are found in any Greek manuscripts. That's the authoritative text. That's what I read. That's why I learn these languages. And that's why anybody can learn these languages. You don't have to go to graduate school. You can get programs for your computer or online and learn them. Plenty of programs to teach yourself biblical Greek. Uh, and get them, download them into your phones and learn it. And then read for yourself. But I have to stick with what scripture says. The words uh, you just being, that you are justified by faith alone are not there. But the phrase, you are not justified by faith alone, but by works, is there. I have to stick with the Bible. 
I'm a Catholic. And I have to stick with what the Bible teaches, not what you want it to teach. So that's what I would suggest to your friend. All right. Uh, they want me to do uh, an email here from Matthew. Uh, Father Mitch, I hold communion to be sacred and that it is the body and blood of Jesus. It's not simply a memorial or symbol to and of Christ, but being a Methodist, am I correct? In correct order with Catholics to receive communion, seeing as I visit Mass once a week generally. Matthew. Well, Matthew, um, here's going to be the difficulty. Um, you know, if you accept our Catholic faith in the Eucharist and your own Methodist church officially does not, then you have a disjuncture in your conscience that the, uh, your, your conscience is Catholic, not Methodist. And well, here's what I would urge you to do, because you know, this is why we don't have open communion in the Catholic Church. We don't want anyone to violate our conscience as to this being the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, and that the Mass is the representation of Calvary in an unbloody way. We don't want to have anybody violate our conscience and teaching on that, nor do we want to violate their conscience. If your conscience is Catholic in formation and you hold to Catholic doctrine, then it may be time to go to the Catholic Church where what you believe is taught. And you know that's something for, for you to, to consider. Um, you know, being in between is not a good place. Okay. And then I have a call. Hello, Carolyn. Carolyn, Hello. you there? Hi. Yes. Where are you calling yes. from? I'm calling from New York. Great. The city? Uh, no, no, out in Long Island. Long Island. Great. Yes. And what's your question? Okay, my question is this. I have a grandson who is a lovely, ethical person in every way, mm -hmm. except he does not believe in God. Okay. And um, the reason being is he says when he was younger, he, he was, he was very ill. He almost died, mm -hmm. and he prayed to God, and God did not hear his prayer. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I tell him God did hear his prayer because he's still, he got well, and he's mm -hmm. alive today. But he says, well, the doctors got me well, not God. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I have him over once a week for dinner. And in my home, we always say prayers at dinner. In his home, they stopped because of him. But in my home, and he <laughs> knows, he sits down, you know, respectfully, and we say grace. Yeah. And I let him know that I will not stop that. And he does continue to come to dinner every good. week. Good. He sounds like a and, good, good young man. But I don't know man. how do I get him to believe. Well, first of all, you don't. Okay? <laughs> Faith is something that God does. I always say conversion is a management issue, and God is management. Pray for him to get that grace to convert. You and I are in sales. We give the reasons to believe. Now, he's going to be a challenge for you, and that's good. That's not bad. He is a challenge, obviously. And I don't know for sure, but I will bet there is more to it than the fact he didn't get healed the way he thought he should. He wanted to see a miracle. And he got healed using doctors. I don't, I'm sure you have the similar experience. That's why you have the sense you do that you've prayed before and you got to the right doctor. Does he think that every doctor knows how to cure every disease? He'd be wrong. And ask the doctors. And the doctors will also tell you they can go so far. And then there, there's something beyond what they can do. And they're well aware of that. And they also know that there are processes built into the body before the doctors were invented, before there were doctors. 
or nurses or hospitals and that God put those processes in there and they simply cooperate with what's already there by learning how to work with it. So that would be something I would start to, and you may want to take a look at a book, it would be easy enough to, to get a hold of and useful. It's called The Case for the Creator by Lee Strobel. Get a hold of that and see and read it with him, if he'll, if he'll do that. That may help you to get to some of the other issues that are bothering him as well. Strobel was an atheist and he came back quite around. All right, we have a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Uh, Batesville, Indiana. Great, and your question? Father, what, when you study scripture also, there's so many translations sure. out there now even Catholic translations, yeah. which one do you think is the best when you're doing a scripture study? The one that I, uh, if, if I'm using English, I will use the Revised Standard Version. You know, that, that's the one I'll use. When I write, I use that one. Translation is always a balance between good style and literal translation. You have to get a balance. And I like the Revised Standard. The Ignatius Bible uh, publishes the Catholic edition of that. That is my favorite. And that's the one I use. That's the one I, I cite in my books. You know, when that's I, not the one they use on Sundays, correct? No, it's not. They, they use the, um, uh, the New American, which itself has been revised. Uh, it, and the New American is much improved over what it was in the 80s and 90s. I could not, I just want to be kind. But um, <laughs> let's just say that when my students read that in class, I would have the, the Hebrew or the Greek text. I always read from the original in class. And they would read that, and I would just yell at them, stop, that is not what it says. And then I would translate it for them myself. You know, so, but now it is much improved. They had a liturgist go over at one time that ruined it. <sighs> uh, all right, we are out of time, uh, especially on this feast of St. Teresa of Avila. May the Lord bless you and draw you to an ever deeper prayer life. I love of finding him in the sacred scriptures and coming to know the word who is present in that word. May Almighty God bless you the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, and by the intercession of St. Teresa, lead you into great depths of prayer. Amen. And again, we ask you to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable. We have a lot of bills here. We do some great specials and stuff, but it costs a lot of money, so uh, help us out a little bit uh, every month, and we'll keep on going and bring this to you. Thank you. Thank you.